Regarding the chord progression, that is, even though I used a picturization that was music, I assume that those of you who have no real immediate familiarity with music do understand that that was not important. It just so happens that the temporary names I had picked out for the forces of C, D, and E do happen to be notes in the Western scale of the notes A through H if you live in Alabama. The rest of the world is A through G. The chord progression has something specific in mind. It was not just an interesting picture I conjured up. <coughs> Although that would seem to be going in a linear line, you do understand that all of this is very ephemeral and it is limited to words on the surface. And so there is no other way that I can explain it without complicating it beyond belief at the present. But if you looked on it, that is all of life, as being a song and there is a chord progression. Now arbitrarily, for me to say it goes from C to D to E, I have to do the very thing that some of you tried to write me questions about last week. Someone, several people point out that they would see that it was their observation that they could perceive things apparently being in the key of C. It would apparently be rather constructive, would be new, and see them go to D. But then several people asked me, does it not have to be possibly otherwise? They could start from D and go to C. If so, I can't see it. You have to remember your perception, ordinary consciousness going into a song and believing it sees a beginning. Now I'll take part responsibility for a particular reason that I normally refer to C, or I have been, C going somewhere else. Because for one reason, if I did start describing or you thought you were observing a situation where life or some aspect that you were observing was in D, it is simply harder at the present time to get your attention to focus on us cutting up reality and starting here where things are already going downhill. You know, who the hell cares or why start here? It is just natural to the way things are wired up to want to pick out what would appear to be something new rather than to start, well, let's, let's all go to the dump heap and we'll start there and see how garbage rots <laughs> and helps produce flowers and potatoes. You know, the whole chain of photosynthesis on that level is still in operation. So remember, it's arbitrary for me to say from C to D to somewhere else. But also note when you seem to have a question of why it appears that it's easier to see C going to D than to see D going to C. That is simply OAI consciousness chopping up reality that, all right, I can see C. But wh why do I never see D going somewhere else? It is a fair question, and besides what little I have just hinted, you're also back to my question to you for many months, why is it that all news seems to be bad news? Not just coming from the media, but why is it that to you, to ordinary consciousness, everything appears to be bad news? Although I periodically point out that measles are killing your grandparents, and now people are, have artificial hearts and plastic livers and who knows what. And you hear that and think, yes, yes. And your grandfather, in his day, they did not believe that an automobile would ever go a mile an hour, 60 miles an hour. And nowadays, space shots, nobody pays any attention. It hardly makes the front page anymore. And you hear all that and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then ordinary consciousness turns right around and it sees everything going downhill. So I turn the question back to you. Do you not find that interesting? <laughs> All right, the chord progression. And let me remind you again, although I'm arbitrarily doing it too, if we said, all right, let's start right here. We're jumping in the middle of the song. This song has been going on since humanity has been going on, and ordinary consciousness cannot see the end of it. It sees no uh, coda. It sees no ending to the song. So we just start here. Let's assume that it's in C whatever this one aspect that we apparently are observing. The more obvious one is it apparently goes from C to D to E, that apparently something was new, 
All these words are not mutually exclusive. It's like me giving you temporary names for the forces. Just pick out one that seems to work for the time being. Pick out one that might be a temporary mouth. But it would apparently be that a situation, something new in art, clothes, philosophy, religion, politics, it apparently starts out and it's new. There's some sort of excitement, assuming that you are not so wired that you get negatively involved that this is not good. Just if you could simply see here is something new and you could refrain from becoming entangled in it yourself. Then the more common way in which consciousness would observe what I'm describing was apparently it started off and it seemed to be in favor of some sort of growth at least within some limited area or perhaps affecting some limited number of people. It seems to be a movement of some kind of goodwill. And then you can track it a while and then it appears to be the most common that begins to turn almost into its opposite or it begins to decay. That what apparently was its original aim gets distorted or the people involved lose track of what it was. Also along this particular line it would appear that then it would go into what is harder to see, that apparently just falls into the key of E, that there's widespread indifference, like who cares? Or maybe at one time that was worthwhile, that religious idea, that philosophical school of thought, it went into decay, it turned into its own opposite. Thank God now nobody even thinks about it. It's just become a moot point, nobody cares, it's perhaps of minor historical significance. But that is not the only way it can go. I could start somewhere and pick out C, and it would apparently go, I could describe it. That doesn't mean that's the only way it could be described. And you could see it as going almost immediately, or directly, not necessarily immediately, from C to E. So the chord progression is not simply over and over, C to D to E to C to D to E. It is every possible combination, even going in a straight line. It can be C to E to D to D to E to C, to E to C to D, <laughs> comma. We're still at the first, getting into the first paragraph. <coughs> I want you to try and perceive this. Since everyone seems to be interested, all human consciousness is interested in why things don't work, or why things apparently start out in one line, that this sounds like a good idea. This would be good for humanity if this could be carried to its proclaimed conclusion. And it never happens. So cry the critics and other miscellaneous soreheads. <laughs> and then on the individual level, apparently you start out filled with goodwill, filled with hope that this new idea, this new undertaking will bring about fruitful results for you and yours. The chord progression, unless there is someone involved who has understanding and who can act on it, without that, the chord progression on every level will run its inevitable course. It doesn't matter whether you pray fast or even if you thought you got slick enough that you had some awareness of how mechanically the chord progression runs and you decided I'll just hang out until it changes keys. <laughs> Which without them knowing it, parenthetically, I might point out, there have been would-be schools of mysticism that they did not know how to explain it, that that was what they were involved with. That's what life was speaking through them on a very crude level of when the flow does not seem to be going correctly or you cannot seem to have any effect over it. It seems to be beyond your control is take a break. Mm -hmm. you know, go visit the temple, find an ashram, go lay low under the bed you know, <coughs> until this whole thing blows over. That's what a sly, that's what a partially enlightened person would do. I guess still in the parentheses, there are some of you that have found favor with that. I've never attempted to describe it in that way, and that certainly is not the point of this. But it is not just a temporary trick. 
to draw upon the illustrious works of the American Broadway Theater, I might point out that there is quite real validity in the song, if I may change the words a bit, of do not dream the impossible dream, and please don't fight the unbeatable foe. You, know, you have to leave that to the man of La Mancha, but there is a time in which the correct kind of action would be no action. In parentheses. Without a personal understanding of some nature, and of course by that I refer to something other than the hardwired, particularly yellow circuit in the beginning, reaction to what's going on, to your own biochemical responses at line level consciousness, without something beyond that and without the ability to take some action on it, then every chord progression on every level will run its inevitable course, whatever it was, whether it's going from C to D to E or any other variation. And there is nothing, there is no amount of faith, there are no magic charms, there are no mantras, there is nothing that is going to interfere with that chord progression. Now taken to a certain level, without giving you the blues, I will also point out there are limits to what any one person can do. That there are certain ways in which the chord progression will move, believe me, say historically, that is on a very large scale, that if you became entangled with it, you would indeed be attempting to beat the unbeatable foe. And I have tried to instill in you already tried to disentangle you from any belief that there is such a thing as a profitable martyr attempting to beat an unbeatable foe. You might as well be playing for the Mets or attempting to be a good Christian or a Jew or something. Within the chord progression, to get down to something we have talked about before, within the chord progression itself, attempt to picture it for the time being as being on a larger scale. But you would have tempos within tempos. I am not going to tell you that there is one chord progression running through life at any given time, or that there's one chord progression even running through one area of the planet, one nationality, one religion. There are chord progressions going on at different speeds. But within the chord progression, let me change the picture just a bit to get to what we had talked about before, what I tried to get you to look at. Try and consider within the overall chord progression. Those of you, I keep thinking everyone has some little idea of music. That's just like, let's say, at least three notes to make a chord. And you might hold that chord for 12 bars, 12 measures. Of course, 12 measures to life could be 100 years. But you can play one chord, like on a keyboard or a piano, you can play one chord, and you could sit there if you knew what you were doing and if you didn't bore yourself to death. You could play for years and years, making up melodies that would fit in with that one chord before you ever changed it. So if you looked upon a smaller scale of what would apparently be an individual life as being the melody, a particular melody played with any chord progression, then it's on this smaller level that you would have the places I referred to as being a triadial vacuum. And I bring this up on the basis of me already pointing out that there reaches a level where the chord progression itself is going on on a large scale, affecting whole segments of this planet. If you could see it, there are certain chord progressions that are affecting the whole planet, affecting the body of life itself. And therein, what I'm pointing out to you is initially a non-fertile field to attempt to jump into. Parenthetically, I could point out again for your pleasure and consideration. What is it that all general forms of ordinary religion and would-be mystical systems directly attempt to involve themselves with? <laughs> the impossible. It serves a purpose, but the impossible. That everyone's accustomed to it. You never think about it. But if you hear that there's some new prophet, some new guru, some offshoot of some organized religion, that seems to be taking some new 
direction. Or just suddenly this religious person pops up and says, I have a whole new plan. If he gets, if he gets big enough, the circumstances are right that he makes the media, you, you don't even question it. What you're used to hearing is they say, well, what do you plan to do now that you have gained our attention and you seem to have a large following, you're collecting large amounts of money? Then it's always, well, I'm going to change the world. I'm here on a mission, whatever the story is, but it's always, if it's not the world, then at least it's a good attempt. That is, I am here to wake up America. Things are in a hell of a mess, and I've been sent here to straighten it out. I mean, they don't fool around. Still in the parentheses, we don't really have to refer back to the man of La Mancha. All of you should recall that it was either me or Kai Root One who also pointed out that one of the benefits of attempting the impossible is it keeps you from attempting the possible. End of parentheses. It would appear to be at the melody level. That is, it would appear to be at your individual life when you can do something. When there is this situation where a triad is continually shifting. And it is there also that the melody will take, in relationship to the overall chord progression at that time and place, the melody too will take its inevitable course unless you understand something and unless you take some action. But it is at the, if you understand, I'm I'm really referring to, as Ezekiel said, wheels within wheels. It's music within music. It is differing tempos, different rhythm patterns within a larger rhythm pattern. But ordinary consciousness, now the question you could pursue on your own, why is it? Now, it's not cheap criticism on my part for me to point out that all religions, all would-be mystics of all kinds, they're just without any doubt. The gods obviously tell them. You know, God didn't pick me out, says some little prophet or mystic. He didn't pick me out to sit around here and deal with 20 or 30 people. They don't ever say that. Or somebody, that, they don't ever come up and say, oh, I had a mystical experience or I fasted for 24 days and suddenly the God spoke to me and said, hey, I got some good people out doing work for me and I know you've been interested, but to tell you the truth, you know, you're not the strongest candidate I ever had. <laughs> you know, so uh, I'll tell you what, why don't you move down to uh, Snellville, Georgia, you know, see what you can do. I don't expect a lot, and so don't be as disappointed if you don't get anywhere. It is always, because that is the way consciousness is attuned. It's not an attack. But now you should be able to piece some of this together, at least in general. You know, how fast would life be moving if it did operate on a small scale? Rather than just talk about men, life operates on a large scale. When it daydreams, when it daydreams, we all get sick. When it has nightmares, the whole planet shakes. But it didn't have little small dreams. And so then it comes out in consciousness. It comes out in people who believe they're involved with some sort of work that I am here to beat the unbeatable foe with the God's help, of course. You have got to be able to see, which is the understanding part, and then you've got to move on it, that what is going on and what seems to be your personal life, not just your relationship with the person with whom you live, but what's going on when you walk in a store and you feel as though you've been insulted, or when people in a shopping mall bump into you, <clears throat> when your family doesn't seem to respect you and understand that you have great, as yet unmined abilities, that everywhere there seems to be a conflict, there is continually turning within this individual and in the smaller level, the melody part, there is a triad always turning. And before it can be replaced, before all three legs will come back down, although sometimes I grant you, it's difficult to see, to feel, but there is always an opportunity. There's always a momentary lapse before the final leg gets down 
<coughs> Normally, if, it, if a hint would help, you're talking about the E leg, to where that which either seemed to be C or D is being replaced, or is about to be replaced with that which formerly appeared to be irrelevant. And you have to jump in and make it relevant. And it doesn't matter whether it's rational. It doesn't matter whether it would seem to be fulfilling an overall plan. I convoluted that sentence. It would apparently be that which in the, to chop up reality and jump in, in a triad, the last leg that's going down when it shifts would be an area that previously seemed to be irrelevant. Of course, some of you should already be able to whether that makes any sense or whether you understand the basis of it, should already see that because the only parts you see ordinarily is the C and the D, that which you favor and that which seems to be polarized to what you seem to favor. And so that continues to shift, to argue with this woman, this man. Sometimes I win, sometimes they win. Sometimes I get sick of it and walk off. You're almost getting close to E. Sometimes the other person gets mad and they just get insane. They keep accusing me or harping about the same old thing. And sometimes I'm past the point of being mad. I can just walk off and forget it or I can lay down and take a nap and let them continue to talk. There is a prime example of where you can fill in where E was. And that's one of, if you can see it this way, one of the benefits of E being so vague is it doesn't matter what the hell you do. But if you do not do something, the melody and the overall chord progression is always going to run its inevitable course regardless of who you think you are. Unless you can understand what's going on to a degree that's beyond ordinary. And then unless you act, it's going to go on. Because you may think that you understand it, which is the stages some of you are still going through of trying to tell me and to ponder to yourself that at times I feel as though I am surely on the intellectual wavelength with the gods, if they existed. And then almost in the next breath, you have feelings of being impotent. Well, if I'm so smart, why don't things go better? You got to have the some extraordinary understanding and then you've got to act on it. Because just having understanding, that's like saying, well, I hear where the melody is going, and I don't like it. Sure enough, yeah, it did go there, and I still don't like it. <laughs> For those of you who have forgotten already, I repeat to you an absolute rule. It just is. Whenever you can see it, well, whatever the situation, and you trying to superimpose, you trying to remember that I'm pointing out that there is always a triad. There are always three legs involved supporting any situation, I don't care what it is. It's me and this person arguing. That's all there is. There's not. And if nothing else, this is not improperly sketched for you. All right, it's you and them. That's all you see, right? All right, where's E? It's everything else. It's everything that's not you and them. It's everything else. The rule I remind you of that there's no escape from. If you don't do something about the triad when it starts to shift, then nothing will be done. And any dream that you ever have, which is ordinary, that somebody else will do something. If you're dealing with ordinary people, you may hear these kind of voices after the fact continue to tell you, well, if this arises again, this person with whom I'm dealing is not absolutely insane. I have seen them in lucid moments. Uh, maybe next time when this comes up, they'll see the folly of their ways. That's it. They cannot be oblivious to this. If this occurs again, the same kind of situation, I am just sure that they'll go, ah, and they'll react differently. And you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. You've had your whole life to know that. A slightly increased danger is you people living together here involved with this. That well, the other person must see, the same as I do, that we are in some sort of improper situation when we get involved with these kind of confrontations, when we have this kind of hostility passed between us. 
and uh, I'll try to do my share, and uh, I'm sure he or she will do their share. They're, they're involved with this too, and we'll all pull together. Forget it. It's a rule. It's an absolute rule. It's mathematical, which, of course, I will save you by not going into. <laughs> but it is absolutely mathematical that nothing will happen unless you understand and then you act. Other than that, everything will run its inevitable course. I don't care who you are. I've had a lot of notes and questions regarding the voices since I brought them up. <coughs> so let me ask you a question. I pointed out that you could observe in a profitable way that there are two voices running <coughs> internally in everyone, which I named the public and the private voice. And if I left it at that, let me ask you this. Why are there only two? Why is it everything else seems to have at least three? I am, of course, attempting, I guess, to give some sort of hint. So assuming I am giving some sort of hint, assuming that any of you are picking up on the hint, then I ask you, where the hell is the third voice? And don't listen to any immediate voices in you right now that say, oh, it's funny you mention that because I had already decided on my own that I could hear three. No, I said there were two and that's all you heard. Now, if you thought you heard three, I'm just telling you this, you were mistaken that the third one was one of the other two because all you have heard are two voices. But I am trying to hint most strongly by asking you the rhetorical question of why, after everything else seems to be absolutely riddled by the number three, and by me even pointing out that nothing happens on this level without the support of three somethings. Well, let's call them forces for the time being. <laughs> then does it not sound suspicious that there are only two voices? No, I didn't say there are only two. I said there are two. <laughs> and so, in line with my hint, where is the third voice? And I repeat, you have not heard a third voice. If one of your voices told you that you were hearing a third voice, I'm telling you now it was wrong. Back to the two, assuming that all of you, even though I have had questions from here and out of town of people feeling as though they were uncertain as to whether they were hearing the public voice and trying to pinpoint certain aspects of one voice they thought they heard and wondered whether that was public or private. Then let's just simply assume that all of you are aware of the fact that there are two voices that go on. And any time, of course, you can be aware of the two voices, they are in some kind of conflict. They're not singing in unison. Or indeed, at any particular moment, if you try to become aware of it, you could not find two voices. They might both be going on. Don't bet on it. Uh, in a minute, I'll mention something about that. But back to what would appear to be the initial, the obvious situation that there are two voices going on. May I ask you again, in a slightly different way, why might things be so arranged through humanity that there is not a single voice, or that we're not operating on the level of animals with only a red circuit, wherein there is no internal self-conflict, as psychologists would call it nowadays. There is no hesitation. There is no ambivalence. There is no diversion of loyalty. The pigs do not stand around and look at slop and think, is this the best I can do? <laughs> or they do not say, you do not hear a voice, in the, a bovine voice in the barnyard cry out, not this slop again. <laughs> the 
the muscles if they were operating in isolation, in pigs and in man, which of course is impossible, it's too late. What I'm suggesting to you would have only one voice. I remember you are no longer strictly a red circuit. I'll say it right quick and maybe some of you will get something out of it. If we could separate the crosstalk between the circuits right now, if I could snap my fingers and everyone simply was in touch with a red circuit operating by itself while still in some strange way being yellow circuit conscious to be able to follow what I'm saying and observe it, the muscles are never in conflict with themselves. Now when you reach the point of a person now that has all three circuits, that is no longer true, of course. If it were, nobody would ever trip. You wouldn't be self-conscious when you walked in a room. You wouldn't cut yourself with a knife. <coughs> so what is it with man? Why might things be so arranged that he has more than one voice? And the voices are in conflict. Why in the world might this be? Of course, bypassing the kind of ordinary response to which all of you are superior, that it's some sort of curse, or worse yet, bring it up to date, it's some kind of mistake, or that humanity has done it to itself. Yeah. If our parents had treated us better, if they hadn't tried to suppress our sexual desires, if my father had let me have a subscription to Playboy when I was 11, <laughs> if it wasn't for all of this, I wouldn't have these internal conflicts. Since all of you are superior to such mundane, routine static, then you're left with the kind of good question is what possible use is being served on a larger scale for humanity to have what is immediately obvious two voices, and they're not in agreement. What possible purpose could this serve? And it do serve a uh, purpose, of course, and I don't mean just to keep psychiatrists and Mercedes Benz. It is serving a purpose in the overall expansion and growth of life. But how? Being arranged this way, how does it expand itself? How does it permeate into everything? And it's right before you. It's in literature, it's in psychology, the echoes of it, the faint shadows of it. And then the reality of it is in you and you're in it. But why does humanity not have one voice? The little thing I said I would mention, how about this? On a mechanical level, there are exceptions to this. I'll just use an ordinary term of a fanatic. Those kind of political is the easiest target to point to. Political fanatic, somebody that comes out and he has all the answers. He knows exactly what group of people to condemn. He knows what nationality or what religion, what other group of people are our enemies. And they apparently have no doubt as to what they're doing. Mechanically, what you have and what humanity ordinarily refers to as a fanatic is he mechanically has been wired up to where the two voices are in agreement. And on a mechanical level, for a short period of time, this history will support me. Not that I need it, thank you. <laughs> there is an undeniable mechanical, albeit, power and attraction on a limited time scale and in a limited area. And of course, they're fanatics. They don't have to be a Stalin or a Hitler. No, they're fanatics working down at a service station, bricklayers, that apparently have no internal conflict within a limited area. They could be talking about race, religion, politics. And there is a kind of attraction. It is real. It is mechanical. And as I said, it is limited because it is always, if I must point this out, 
it is always in the key of D. But humanity, these kind of, what do they call them now, these psychobiologists, attempting to go back and analyze Stalin, Huey Long, he wasn't very good at it, but them trying to, after the fact, analyze how in the world could a madman come along, that's bad enough. But then, large groups of equally mad people are attracted to him and just destroy themselves, just insane. You know, very strange, don't understand it. I could describe it many ways, but I'm telling you one, is there is a mechanical wiring system in the so-called fanatic wherein his voices are mechanically in agreement. And given the right time and the right circumstance, it has a very attractive magnetic pull to it and will create a small sense and center of power. It's in the key of D, but people are drawn to it within a limited area for a limited time. But a fanatic sleeps very well. Fanatics do not go away when the generals come in to a good fanatic that's attempting to overthrow the world or kill all his neighbors. Or for them to come in and his general say, listen, sit down. We have this large portfolio here. We've got to show you how the logistics of our supplies and how the battle on the Western Front is draining all of our energies that we need to defend the Eastern Front. Uh, if we put all of our energies over here, we're going to be defeated over here. It's a very complex situation. We've got to talk to you. Now, whether he does this literally or not, a fanatic goes, you know, fuck that. For them to try to tell him, listen, there are many, many complex areas that must be considered before you can make a judgment as to what we should do next. Not on your life. There is, when the voices, even mechanically, are in agreement, you do not have doubt. Fanatics do not go away and lock themselves in the bathroom and strike poses like the thinker. <laughs> the closest they come to that is they already know what to do is they may think, well, I'm running out of bullets. Where, where, can, where can I get some bullets? <laughs> but it's not a matter of what should I do next. Or, I assume you already understand this. Much less, it's not a problem of somebody saying, listen, have you considered really the overall ultimate ramifications on humanity and psychologically is based on what you're doing? Doesn't it make you wonder? Don't you have any doubts as to the propriety of the actions you're taking? It doesn't even make sense. Nothing bothers you? Yeah. We're going to get more bullets. <laughs> It is within the same framework of that kind of internal melody, I might point out, that it's not only limited to politics, you find it in religion in its widest aspects into the so-called mystical cult fields. It's for somebody to pop up, an archetypical man with a turban, to pop up and say, I know what's going on. It's quite simple, I'll tell you. There's nothing to discuss. I got right here in a pamphlet, got right here in the book, and I'll tell it to you. And that's it. And there is an attraction to that. People cannot analyze it. And I told you from the beginning when I had pulled out these examples for particular reasons, it's not an attack on them. It is a part of life. It serves a purpose. But given the right time, the right circumstance, and the right kind of grid people, there's an attraction. You just feel sure, if you're that kind of person, that Swami X does not go home and pray. He does not go home and have to pour himself a big old glass of gin and think, what in the hell am I telling those people? Now, it does happen if you want another parenthesis. If I'm going to get too convoluted, I guess I should start with brackets. <laughs> and then we'll get the parentheses. There are cases of alcoholic ministers and gurus 
and they can't hide it. It always comes out, there's always some kind of little scandal. <laughs> but it's not just finding out that the guy goes home and gets drunk all the time. Uh, they can feel that something is not up to snuff. It's just a mechanical reaction that uh, he does have doubts. That's not the way they would describe it. It's like, well, the guru has feet of clay somewhere, at least a toe of clay. But when it is a good fanatical situation, when you have in the apparent realm of religion as opposed to politics, when you have someone at the right time in the right place, that the two voices are wired up mechanically to be in agreement, it has an attraction. I'll leave you with the question still, if there is, comma, where is the third voice? And even parenthetically, well, if I hand this much, why don't I say something about it? Paragraph three. I've had a handful of communiques and notes over the last month or so regarding people here and out of town wanting to bring up the subject of love. And I don't mean the sense of lust and some of the things I've been talking about. And I guess once every six or eight months, I can stick our toes back into it plus enough of you are getting a little taste. Humanity did not make up the word love in some way. Or for me to start out saying that what humanity calls love is not worthy of discussion and all those initial apparent attacks I did in the presence of most of you to try to disengage you from your mechanical perception of love being some kind of magical thing and I, it would surely answer all my problems, but why the hell can I do it? Why can I find anybody would do it? And I just told you simply it was misnamed. The people were attempting to run this thing called love from the wrong circuits. Not wrong out in the ordinary world, mind you. But as far as someone being part of the few and trying to directly say, well, I'm going to jump from being what I am into the arms of love. And that would surely take me closer to the gods. That would enlighten me. That would awaken all of my possibilities. That may not be an unfair statement, but there's no way to directly do it unless you're going to be a fanatical follower of a fanatical idea, which is a chord progression that is stuck. <laughs> <laughs> Although I didn't point it out, I, when I changed from politics to religion, I will, many people through their respiratory system agreed that you did hear a piece of what I said when I pointed out that even you have a good fanatic. And apparently they set up a sense of a center of power for a limited period of time. I told you it was in the key of D. And many people's respiratory system here went, yeah. I didn't point it out, but let me go back. It's the same thing as true if you're talking about in the apparent religious field, the mystical field, that you're dealing with fanatic. They're in the key of D. It's not going anywhere. Not for the few. Back to paragraph three. When you first start having, in fact, your first one, I'll go ahead, there's enough of you now, so that it's not really a matter of too many of you being subject to verbal suggestion. But right from the very beginning, when you start having these flashes, when you start having, literally, the nervous system itself ignited that you have biochemical activity in an area of the brain that you have never had. It's what ordinary people would call little mystical states. Of course, some of you think of them or did think of them as huge mystical states. If there would be any word to describe, if we had one word, it would be a feeling of love. 
after it's over, you can try to describe to me. You can just come over and find wherever I am and stick your head up in the window and I can see your face. I can probably smell you coming. But after it's over, if you were pressed to describe in one word, what, what is this? You have to say it was love. Which, of course, is nothing new. Our illustrious tomes within the library system of occult, mystical, religious books, that is always it. God is love. Awakening is love. Uh, being a real person is being a loving person. Uh, it's older than all of us put together, of course. But the feeling, regardless of the word, is quite real. There is nothing phony about it, and there is nothing pseudo about it, and it is not a two-thirds imaginary part of something else. When you taste it, you know what it is. And when you taste it, then you also know, it's of no great importance then, but you also know and understand why I you know, insisted we're not going to talk about love and everything you call love, everything that humanity calls love, everything that even religions call love, forget it. You might as well call it peanut butter. In fact, it would be safer calling it peanut butter because, as far as I know, no large groups of people have ever banded together and slaughtered their neighbors under the banner of peanut butter. But love? Hey, you're asking for trouble, not just large groups of people. Someone will be arrested within 10 miles or wherever. All of us are sitting before the next two or three hours pass that they will kill someone they loved because of love. But at least when you taste the reality of it, then you understand why I insisted. And we're not going to talk about love and everything you imagine about love, forget it. But the feeling. It is a kind of joy and it is a kind of warm familiarity with everything. And the experience of it is literally what everyone else has been talking about from religious leaders to Shakespeare to you when you were having caffeine or amphetamine fits before you met me of dreaming why is the world in such a dither, perhaps even a hissy? <laughs> why can't we all just love one another? Of course, a few of you may have had even temporary lucid moments when you thought, why can't I, in fact, love everybody outside this room like I can sitting here at night by myself? There has to be a familiarity with what's going on. Anything else is part of the chord progression. Anything else can be, for instance, what may appear on the surface to be a kind of religious conversion. Someone being associated with a new kind, for them, biochemical energy through music, through the whole milieu of what seemed to have been going on at that time, through the whole grid structure, everything in such a way that one person can apparently undergo some kind of conversion. And the whole church, the whole mystical group, the community of believers, they all hug the person when they agree, yes, I believe in what you believe in, I see the error of my ways, I believe that love is the center, it is the answer for everything, and I'm not one of you, and they all hug the person. And if you were there, you could look upon them. You might even feel, well, there is something. This is not just imagination. This is not some kind of ordinarily conceived of mass hypnosis. The person's face just takes on a glow. They're just so happy they just want to dance around. <coughs> but you do know by now, without being a cynic, that you cannot trust that to last. Just because they seem to be in some almost supernatural state. You know, God forbid you go out and scratch their new Porsche out in the parking lot. <laughs> that is simply the nature of it. What it takes is a kind of preparation. What it takes is being able to have the state, I'll say for shorthand, and there is a familiarity it's the kind of thing that you had dreamed about, the kind of thing that humanity through the yellow circuit and the tongue has talked about, that we are all neighbors. There with the grace of God go I. Don't condemn someone until you've walked a mile in their shoes. We're all brothers under the skin. 
The tongue, that is life itself through man, has been talking about this as far back as history goes. But there is no familiarity with what's going on at the ordinary level of consciousness. And some passing so-called state of mysticism, conversion, even an accidental ignition of parts of the nervous system does not bring along with it under ordinary conditions with these kinds of people any familiarity with what's going on. They just come back from it when it's over. Once they do find a good Alabama dent in their 928, when it's over, the only thing you can remember is, I was so happy. I've never been so happy in my life. I wanted to hug everyone there in that church or there in that commune. I could have kissed everybody's feet. I could have found my worst enemy and kissed them. Everything was great until I went outside and found out some bastard had hit my new Porsche. But before that happened, I loved everybody, but there was no familiarity. There was no understanding of what was going on. Thus they were shocked back to their normal state. It was like the alloys snapping back once the heat's applied. They're hugging everybody, backing out the door, out of the commune. Yes, I'll get all my belongings and I'll be here with you people tomorrow and kiss everybody, hug everybody. And I, I can't hardly stand to leave you people. I'll go home and get my possessions and I'll be right back and I'll never leave here. God damn. <laughs> and it's gone. You see the fender. It takes a familiarity, and I'll put it very crudely, but I think succinctly, I trust you will, <laughs> that you turn around and there is a dent. I'll put it quite crudely. What else is new? It's not some kind of mechanical resignation. It's not some sort of fatalism, as all of you should. I've taken occasion to point out that verbally, much of this in the beginning could sound like it's leading right down the trail of fatalism, which is a variation. That's almost the other side of the coin of being a fanatic. Rather than being absolutely certain that all voices are in unison and certain about what you're doing, I could say it's the two voices are mechanically in agreement. It's not having any idea what's going on. And therefore, it's, it's kind of an inverted fanatic. <laughs> but there has to be a familiarity that once you can taste this, and it has to do with higher circuits. It has to do in the beginning, I might point out, several of you have asked me this, I'll just give you a slight hint. It has to do with changing the way in which the blue circuit is interacting even below the line, which is why some people do feel that they have had experiences that I did feel a kind of closeness. I did feel a kind of warmth, a kind of, I got to call it love for other people and uh, or for some particular person. And it had a distinct feeling no matter what you say. Below the line, that can be affected a little bit in the same way I point out that there has to be a kind of lateral expansion, even below the line, to correctly support being more conscious. Because if you could do it the other way around, if it were possible, you would suddenly be some kind of unusually enlightened guru, but you wouldn't be able to walk across the street without getting yourself killed, that sort of thing. There has to be a kind of support for it. Part of it is the backdoor approach of me insisting starting from here that you cannot overtly communicate hostility amongst yourselves and then me continually point out even though I can't babysit with you that you can't go about passing the currency of ordinary hostility out in life with anybody or else you're ultimately going to waste your time here you can't do it and it doesn't require the way I described it to you I gave you the most efficient way under the circumstance without any explanation just you can't do it and all of you should be the point of whether you feel as though you have an understanding, you have a kind of nonverbal realization that you can't sit around here on Thursday or every other night or two hours a day and in some way feel as though you're beginning to ignite the nervous system, that you're beginning to approach a state of Buddhahood and then still go out and curse people on the expressway, curse people on the radio, you can, or do it silently. You cannot do that. It's got nothing to do with ordinary morality. You simply cannot do it because you're supporting a crucial juncture where the 
the wiring system is already structured to pass information that comes out in what ordinary people call their emotions. Which brings us back to me telling you that they don't exist like that. They're misnamed for our purpose. But you've got to have a kind of under, uh, understanding so that you've got a kind of familiarity when you have this taste of it. When you start undergoing these almost little mystical flashes. So the kind of feeling you have of warmth, you just feel like your little heart is going to burst out for joy and just, you wish you could run and just grab the whole world and say, goddamn snap out of it. If you could just get everybody on this planet right then, you can just feel it in your own face, that if I could get everybody, if I could dig up Hitler, if I could get everybody right now and give them my face, the whole world, as the advertising people for Coke would have it, the whole world would sing a song together. And I'm not being sarcastic. It's almost true. But you have got to have a familiarity so that a crushed bumper, so that you being apparently filled with this great love and compassion cannot be crushed immediately by you smiling at somebody and they say, what are you looking at? And then it's gone. What do you mean what I'm looking at? I was in a mystical state. I was trying to pass along love. If that's the way you feel, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> then walk away and try to look down and find out where did your great feelings of love, where did that condition go to? It went right over there. Of course, that will be with a few of you, size crowd this size, some of you, that will be when you fully realize what I've been saying, that you cannot be hostile, that this fragile state, like the first time or two that you seem to have been conscious in an absolutely new condition, and there is this feeling that is the reality behind love. You're going to find it for yourself. People have asked me after the fact, you know, if I get it back, what can I do to prolong it? And there's not a direct positive trick that I've ever tried to give out, but I tell everybody one thing, and I'll tell everybody again. And you'll understand it. You won't have to discuss it. That there's one thing that's going to stop it, and you'll know it. There's no doubt. If I get hostile, if I get hostile at anything, if I walk across the street right now, if I step out and an 18-wheeler drives over my toe and I hold it against that guy, it's gone. And you'll understand it just like that. And it's true. We about to tape? Okay. Rolling. Paragraph four. I continue to get throughout the years and up until recently questions from people here, and all of you have felt such questions, even though you haven't written them to me. And that is the feeling of wanting to help alert someone else in this group to their, in your opinion, mechanical, unprofitable behavior. And the first thing that I point out if somebody directly asked me that is it's not your job. And all of you should have had that general impression when I put it in so many words that you cannot go around in this group, and some of you decide in some way, well, I've been here for X number of years, and uh, I'm sure I've had two or three flashes of those kind of states, and this other person just got here, and I can see how mechanical they're behaving, especially in this instance, and it's my duty to help them, and it is not your duty to help them. In fact, if you let out too far, and I get wind of it, and I get a whiff of it, uh, it's bad news. But. I'm going to take this on the basis to start with of this pseudo-psychological approach that we're talking as though we were discussing real people and the way in which they normally talk. That I am just sure the person I live with or I work with somebody else here in this group, I'm around them, and at times I see them begin to behave, to talk. I can see them even thinking about action in such a way that I just know it's unprofitable. What can I do? There is not a direct trick. It is not your job, remember. You do not have leave to take this upon yourself. <coughs> to begin with, without me going into a five-minute preface to get to this point, remember this, you might be mistaken. 
you might be right back in the position of not experiencing life, you're experiencing your perception. But I know the strong feeling, and so I'm going to give you something. All of you that's got pencil and paper, I want you to write this down. And those of you who don't, I want you to get a copy of it. I'm going to give you an indirect, you can look at it as almost a ritualistic task. And the real use of ritual, if there was such a thing, would not be to promote mechanical behavior, which is the way it ends up out in ordinary life, that a ritual, almost by its own definition, is something that is now mechanical. And for me to give out something like this is a trick, because part of it is to relieve you of responsibility. It's to keep you from doing something mechanical yourself, and yet if you feel absolutely that it's proper to do this, then it's because I made it up. If you're in a position, and I don't want this done any more than twice a year, if you do it twice in the next month, and then a week later you're just sure another circumstance is just begging for your participation and your help, don't you do it. You write me a note and ask for what they call it in the church, dispensation. See if I will allow you to do it again. But you only get twice a year without the Pope's permission to do otherwise. Made it up. If you're in a position, and I don't want this done any more than twice a year, if you do it twice in the next month, and then a week later you're just sure another circumstance is just begging for your participation and your help, don't you do it. You write me a note and ask for what they call it in the church, dispensation. See if I will allow you to do it again. But you only get twice a year without the Pope's permission to do otherwise. <laughs> I, I mean this seriously, because I understand that you people take it seriously, and you, and you should. But the feeling that somebody you're living with, you know, whether sexually or you people who are living together in a house or you people who are working together, that at times you're just convinced that another person in here, that as far as you can tell, you feel as close to them as you could anybody in the world, and you feel as though that totally unselfishly, that you see them behaving in a way over and over that you just wish, you just feel like you're about to die if you don't tell them, look, I, I see something that you're apparently not seeing. And you keep doing it over and over. And just, maybe if I just mentioned it to you, it'd jog you out of it, jar you out of it. No. So here's what you can do, twice a year, no more unless you have my written permission. It's got to be sealed and signed by Cardinal Fang. <laughs> I mean, in addition to me, that's just to make sure that I didn't slip up. Besides my humor, I, this is very serious. It should be serious. Of course, you understand, or some of you do by now, those of you that didn't frighten, it's not suicidal. It's serious, but not suicidal. You may take a piece of paper. I'd prefer if you had a business card. And you may write on it, the DC, DC. That's the name of this ritualistic task. And that stands for the distant, caring, disjunctured, card. And that's all you write on it is the D period, C period, D period, C period. My quick and only one time exposition at all on this the name I picked out, the distant, is like an admission from you, a stated awareness that I am not wired as you are. So what, by you, if you ever do this, handing somebody that card, you're saying that I believe that I am seeing you reacting to your own hardwired system, the old ordinary level of consciousness. 
But the first part of the DC DC that I mean is I am distant. I am not wired up like you are. So whatever you're getting from me, there is a distance between us. A real distance. That at the ordinary level, I am not you. The caring, I don't guess I should have to even comment on. The disjunctured is also a direct, it's a variation of the distant. Now, it's more than a variation. You should be able to hear it. It is the also stated awareness on your part, even if you don't have it. Since you're doing it by my say-so, in a way I have made this up, so it all comes back to me. But by you handing the card, whether you can be aware of it at the time, that's why I wanted you all to make some note that I'm the one who described it. The disjuncture is a stated admission coming from me through you that my perception of what you're doing very likely is colored to some degree. That we are in different points in the grid carry it to a little further degree, it is an admission that I do not fully understand what's going on. Because if you fully understood what's going on, you could have an effect on it. And you can't. You can't even try it. I just leave you the ability to try it. And so you're admitting that my perception of what I think is your mechanical unprofitable behavior is very likely colored <clears throat> and I do not understand it. Or I could do something about it. And card, I surely don't have to comment on. Those of you who have pencils and pens, <laughs> write this as fast as you can. This is almost what the card is saying. But remember, if you had somebody, all you put on it is the DC DC. But from me to you, from me through you to the other person that if you ever hand this to anybody, <clears throat> this is what you are saying and I am putting the words on it. So I am taking responsibility for the words of it and the intent you have to take responsibility of handing it to someone and then being able to do what I'm about to describe, that you've got to be able to behave, you've got to be able to control your thoughts about behaving in line with what I'm about to describe that I want you to write down, that this is what the card is tacitly saying, is that everything in me seems to say that you are acting unprofitably. and with only ordinary awareness of what you are doing. Period. I have my own similar fits. And can only offer you this card as per our task. period. I will, comma, by all I have and understand, comma, try to give you my unconditional support and encouragement. I have, has, no, that's the end. <laughs> now we're back talking. I have hesitated for many moons to ever let you people get involved with any of this. So beyond my 
parallel humor, let me tell you that this is deadly serious, that somebody could get thrown out of here. Because I'm not telling you to ever do this. I'm not hinting to you. If none of you ever do this, I will be quite pleased, satisfied. You will not have gone astray by failing to act, by feeling as though this other person that I know and love so dearly, surely, if I just hand the DC DC card, it will snap them out of it. You better think, you better ponder, you better neuralize, because I ain't gonna get you for not acting. I will never pop up behind the bush and say, look, I saw what's been going on, and you should have handed that person a DC DC card. <laughs> never. If you never do this, you will not have run any risk of going astray. But if you do, you're running a risk because you take on responsibility that I'm not going to dwell on forever tonight. But you take a responsibility. But if somebody ever does hand you one in here, if you ever get one from somebody, both of you had better treat it very seriously, not suicidally so. And I want you to remember, I want everybody to, those of you who didn't write it down, I want you to write it down that that is what the card is saying because I say that's what it's saying. And concluding by saying I will, by everything I have and know, try to give you my unconditional support and encouragement. But I am the part, the rest of it that I didn't put down. The kinds of things you're saying, I'm not your critic. I could be mistaken. This is my perception. I hesitate to do it. I got my own problems. I can't tell you how to undo what you're doing. I can't even tell you how to stop it. And if he hadn't told us or given us this DC DC thing, uh, I wouldn't even say anything, or I'd feel like I shouldn't, which you would have been correct. So you better save this like the poor fanatic would looking for bullets. If you never use it, fine. But if you are absolutely overcome, if you're just absolutely, you might consider doing this. But you had better be careful, because I'll hold you responsible for doing it. I'm responsible for the description of it and what I intend. But I hold you responsible for ever doing it. I'm going to read some. I picked out a bunch of, see I make little notes, I put stars on the ones that I'm just going to read up here and respond to and then I put some of them star and an F, which means funny. And what little I can go by on my own plans, what few plans I have is, if I ever get around to them on a particular night, is to read the ones that were just a star that I was going to respond to and then file through when I run across a star and an L, put it on the bottom like the close of the laugh, which everyone likes that. <laughs> well, if you're my kind of people, that is real people, you like the close of the laugh. But it appears that almost all of them tonight have stars and Fs. There was one, somebody in the gist of something else, <clears throat> pulled out a quote from one of the British poets, if I remember correctly. And they just threw it in. They just thought I'd be interested, which they were correct. I'd never seen it, but listen to this. Quote, the old order changeth, making way for the new. Least one good custom should corrupt the whole world. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Does anybody hear about me saying that there could be no such thing as a straight line? Me pointing out that as ordinary consciousness thinks of heaven, that is a place where there is no illness, no conflict, we're not of different races or religions. They're not talking about heaven. Mm -hmm. If such a place could exist, it would be hell. It would be the ultimate depot of destruction. Or we can see something, surely we'd all agree, being reasonable people. Here is a new, constructive, liberal idea. Let's crank this thing up, get the steam built up, get it on the track, and let it run forever. If that could happen, this person, life spoke through somebody. Make way for the new, at least one good custom should corrupt the whole world. I just never heard that. Can children be influenced for the better, particularly before they are semi-solidified? A newer person asked this 
lot of you have heard me respond in a little bit, I'll point right quick. It would seem to be just a sitting, begging situation. That if you had children, if you had access to influencing a child, I will try to raise the child in a more enlightened way. What you will do is raise a maniac if you went too far, which uh, some of you have been exposed. There have been some people came through here that tried to raise their child, what they said, in a more awakened manner. Uh, if you attempted, I'm not saying that you shouldn't try anything, but if you attempted, if you were an ordinary would-be mystic, and you attempted, I'm going to raise this child and protect it from the kind of destructive, unmystical influence of the world, you would raise a maniac to use the term that some of the systems have used about that the point of this is for a man to wake up from this kind of ordinary sleep. That just happens to fit an easy description I was going to give you that is true, but it fits those words. Nobody can wake up until they go to sleep properly. And for you to take a child and attempt in some way to isolate it and decide I won't let it uh, watch any television, I won't let it listen to rock and roll music, uh, I'll be careful, I'll take her or him to school every morning, and I'll come that recess and make sure who they associate with, I'll pick them up as soon as they get th uh, out of school, and I'll hand select their playmates. I will cut out everything that my perception tells me is non-mystical, or is non-constructive in the world, and I'll isolate them from it. If it was possible, which is not, by the way, but if it was possible, you would raise an absolute maniac. You have got to go to sleep before you can wake up. That, of course, is not the descriptions I normally use. You have got to live out up until the age of maturity. You have got to let the circuits go ahead and get ignited in the way that you are already genetically wired up for. Now, if I was going to give behavioral advice to you people with children, is simply one thing is do not. One, what you can't go wrong on is do not allow them. As soon as they can talk, and if you knew how before they can talk, is say, listen, I do not allow any outburst of hostility. None. Do we understand each other? There might be a few other things pop up, like putting jelly in my shoes in the morning, but that I can live with. But if you want trouble with a capital T, let me tell you, I just, I will not stand. If you try it once, it's going to be the sorriest day of your life, and you won't try it twice. You, know, you can't talk about people. You can't gossip. You can't ever tell me anything negative about another person or about your feelings about life. And, of course, the first time they do it, uh, of course, they're that small. The main way you get to them is, you know, beat them to death. <laughs> but, the, but, but the first time they do it is do everything in the world that will get their attention, you know throw them out of trees, hit them with cars, throw them down the steps, <laughs> slap them around, insult them, do everything. Of course, I am being a little funny, but that is what you can do. Oh, yeah, I forgot one thing. Uh, you've got to do it, too. <laughs> you understand? I mean, you've got to do it to her, it won't work, is what I mean. Pop psychology seems to emphasize that in order for a man and woman to have a good, quote, relationship, today communication is necessary. What, if anything, is life actually seeing through such statements, and et cetera? And all of you have heard that, I guess. Psychologists and sexual therapists and <clears throat> bartenders, everybody says, you know, the important thing is you got to communicate. <laughs> well, let me point out just these kind of questions. I, note to you again, when you are good enough to come up with this kind of observation, you're also, many times I send you back the note just saying a splendid area for you to pursue on your own, that you're onto something. You know, look out for periods. Don't decide that you have reached a conclusion. But I will give you a couple of hints or ways you might try approaching this. This thing that life now has people, at least in the Western world, talking about relationships must be based upon continual, truthful communication between us. One comment, it's just one with a comma, is like life through these two people, whether they're doing it or whether they're just talking about doing it. It's just variations of the same melody. 
It's like trying to give a clear display of where they're standing amidst their two-part harmony. And like everything else, it is not on the ultimate scale having to do with their particular benefit. But can you see that it would help over a long range? Can you get a glimpse that this kind of continual attempt for two people to keep saying, all right, I'm singing this melody. Another person saying, well, I'm singing one that conflicts with it, perhaps. Or I don't like your melody, which, of course, is part of their melody. <laughs> that in an overall sense, can you get a glimpse that that might be helping life get a sensation of where the chord should go next? You know, kind, <laughs> kinds of things. <laughs> Or those of you real quickly that follow music a little bit, you know, jazz musicians, people attempting to improvise uh, when they reach a certain kind of level, or certain types of them, they have a term, they call it playing licks, that a guy's got technique down, he can sit down and play piano, he can play chord changes, and we'll say, all right, play, the, play this song through, all right, now take it. And he'll play, but he plays, quote, licks. As he's playing things just mechanically, he's picked up off other records, uh, he just sits there and he plays, we can almost whistle, and he thinks he's improvising. And he does change around the licks, perhaps, not in the same order every time they play it, but he's playing licks. And now you could attempt to further describe it, or they should be at that point, some of them, that real improvisation is to attempt never to play a lick. It's to stay far enough ahead of your fingers, the muscle system itself, that every lick I want to play I refuse to. It doesn't matter if it's just the opposite. At least I will not play a fucking lick. <laughs> I mean, I know it's going so fast and I'm so befuddled right now, and I'm not even sure where I am. The only thing my muscles want to do, they're crying out, licks, licks, you know, let me play licks. <laughs> it's whatever it is, if I can stay a split second ahead of it, I, will, I won't play a lick. I don't care what the hell I play, but I ain't going to play a lick. <laughs> can any of you get a glimpse right quick that there could be a parallel between life getting this chord progression going, I know not many of you ever liked for me to point this out, about life not knowing from your kind of mortal viewpoint, from my ordinary level of consciousness, life not knowing exactly what it's doing, in a sense, any more than you do. But it's ignorance on a grander scale, which few of you understand is supreme wisdom. But when you're so much ignorant, you know, if life, if our amount of confusion at the ordinary level and ignorance is that, then life, you know, in every direction is so huge that it's no longer ignorance. But could any of you get a glimpse that life is attempting perhaps not to play licks by people continually pointing out, well, here's where I stand. Or here's my part of the melody right now is, I love you. Another person's melody is, no, you bug me, I'm tired of you. Life getting some sensation about, well, maybe, is that becoming a lick now? What will I do next? <laughs> funny, funny. Here's one I just marked to read. I didn't put funny, so I may not have a question. About the time last week that the words chord progression were leaving your lips, I was struck with an amazing observation of, quote, of course. And why hadn't it struck me earlier to look at things in that way? In the scrutiny of what you seem to be mentioning of harmonic progressions, I first noted to myself that like the tones of a chord, a triad, I point out, that in Western music, in a sense, you don't really have an identifiable real chord and without three notes. At least that's the basis. And this person saying, I know that like the tones of a chord, a triad, it took all three notes to really make it an identifiable chord. A progression two needs at least three chords in order to have any observation worth noting. I ain't going to dwell on it. I know what the person means. That's, I could, I'd never put it that way, but that's almost true. That in a sense, you don't have a real song unless you have at least three chords going through the progression. Trust me and him for what he's pointing out. To use examples, and he's referring to what I did last week when I pulled out the uh, opening line to a song, if you remember, the old blues song went, love ain't nothing but the first stage of the blues. So he refers back to this. And the person points out, of me saying that love ain't nothing but the first stage of the blue, blues, if I left it at that, it would seem as though that was only a two-chord song. 
In other words, going from love to the blues, maybe from C to D. I'm cutting up and picking out the more salient points, but the person continues, if we were to say lust into love into the blues, suddenly it would seem more in line and even miraculous to me that there is now a new set of connections and the first seems to more explain the last in a more comprehensive manner. It's kind of spoken of in life at times that great wealth equals great misery. And the person's attempting to point out that would almost seem like a two-chord progression. You follow what? But people can't seem to understand why this may be so, even though it seems to strike them as having some validity. But what if we were to say, quote, great greed brings great wealth, which turns to great misery. <laughs> then great misery's arrival is not necessarily so surprising. <laughs> I'm just going to read this, I believe. Life seems to speak about things it does not understand, or at least appears, does not appear to understand as if these things are alive. But if life can de devise an explanation for anything, it speaks in a manner that also implies the thing is a mechanical process. Second paragraph, I began to understand that ordinary explanations are fatal. <laughs> Writing like talking is an action. Usually it is an action in response to thinking about action. Being an action that closes the open loop of possibilities created by thinking about action, by using the energy to complete the process. This explains how making lists or pontificating on what you're going to do often ends the original plan. <laughs> All right, this is not the first time somebody has written me a note hinting about that. So I guess the time's come for me to point out something that a lot of you we've sat around the past years and spoken about, and I've made a joke Somebody already knew what I was about to say. And I point out jokes that somebody would say, boy, uh, I'd like to buy a, if I had the money to buy a boat and go off and sail the South Seas or sail around the world. And then they start talking about the cost of boats and uh, you know, how hard it would be to save up money. And I pointed out, not just boats, but several would-be hobbies people's had. I point out, look, uh, there are several yachting magazines. One of them is about $22 a year, which is a pretty heavy subscription. Subscribe to two or three of those, read them, or if you want to really save money, go to the library. Check out every book they got on sailing, read them, and you might end up and save yourself $150,000. <laughs> and sometimes when I'd pull that, somebody, if there was four or five of us sitting around, somebody would, through their respiratory system and otherwise, might laugh like some of you did then, and several people at times would give a look like, I almost hear something, I don't like that, I ain't gonna do that. <laughs> And I never said, you know, the purpose of it, and I always present it kind of as a joke. <coughs> See how my jokes turn into other people's reality? <laughs> and so I said, I asked myself, I said, what's the difference between seeing something new in the universe for the first time and seeing something old in the universe for the first time? <laughs> when all of a sudden, this little birdie flew by and said, you've almost got it. It's the seeing something for the first time is the difference in the universe. And I thought about that for a long time. <laughs> Sometimes it seems that the sitting on Thursday night before the meeting could be liked unto life getting together its available energy in the attempt to neuralize. And life's, in the life corporation, if thinking about acting, is unused or potential capital and mechanical action is merely providing the necessities or breaking even, then perhaps conscious action means showing a profit. <laughs> One might wonder if a person consistently showed a profit, would promotion be forthcoming from life? I guess we're down to the funnies. For the facts file, I continue to get these, which I'm delighted to. 
New fact, anything that gets put in a Tupperware container will never get eaten. <laughs> And I'll bet you people know who this is because then it has a final sentence that says, is this justice or what? <laughs> <laughs> Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, dot, 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 is it likely that this refers to the ditch between the red and the yellow circuit? <laughs> Some say history is the birth certificate of the present. Others say that the present is the epitaph of history. The bucket of dialectics has a thousand leaks. <laughs> Boy, I just hate it when you people come up with something that I never thought of. Makes me look bad that I didn't think of that. But nonetheless. Same person had another one. A tree chanced upon the notion of thinking about the action of movement, and soon it began to try to lean this way and that way. A lumberjack noticed this proclivity and felled it, and as, <laughs> felled it as the tree leaned in the direction convenient to his efforts. The woodsman sat down and mused upon his good fortune and thought, it's lucky for me that that son of a bitch never got around to walking. <laughs> So this is from a newer person that never heard our famous or my famous list of famous secret facts, which is, I mean, you remember one of the facts was that trees can walk. It's just that they don't have any place to go. <laughs> got a final, got a list from the great Big Apple. I couldn't resist. I was going to put this in the file. We're still compiling the file. Many of you will find some of the things you've written that I don't read or that I haven't read is going to be in our group file once we make it available when I'm sure that none of you will have severe brain damage. <laughs> it's just a list sort of of, you'll see. In the horizontal world to observe a dog's actions and to say he's hungry or he wants to go out is not considered remarkable and yet mind reading is considered a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> you say you want to learn how to read minds, just turn on the TV set and turn off the sound, and it all becomes clear. <laughs> One reason that time seems to be going faster and faster is that technology eats up great gobs of it in maintenance and re-education. Could this be the force in the techno system, the ultimate ghost in the machine? Finders keepers, seekers weepers. <laughs> the secret must be just for the few. Why? Because if it were for the many, it would no longer be a secret, and life gains at least as much from the search as it does the discovery. The universal human desire for entertainment seems to mark a horizontal reflection of the desire for enlightenment. Anything sufficiently interesting to, quote, distract the organism from its normal business of inner chatter and complaint is welcomed as much as water on the hottest desert. White persons with not, not persons all in a ditch. Not persons dig it, white persons bitch. <laughs> if laughter is the best medicine, what's the worst disease? <laughs> TV, a familiar, friendly, non-threatening world in the corner of your living room where the good guys always win. Same plot as the Bible, huh? Probably the same author, too. <laughs> I've got a task I want everyone to do. By the way, you people out of town, uh, several people asked me about St. Quantum's Day. Uh, since you were pressing me, I would have probably let it pass due to the previous difficulty at our last party. But I will assume that everybody's been forewarned enough. If not, 
I'll throw somebody else out. It's not that hard to do. That is, if we're going to get together and have fun with the added attraction. That should be a word, attraction. It's a combination of something that's attractive, and yet it may turn out to be garbage in the long run. So with the added attraction of the gods of Bacchus, it turns out St. Quantum's Day, by my reckoning, would fall on March the 23rd. That Saturday would be the actual entertainment. But since I'll be out of town on one of these meetings, we will hold it on the 30th. That will be, if you remember, from sunup to midnight the Friday, which is supposed to be on a non-solid food fast. And then, if you, those of you who want to, St. Juan's Day starts technically at midnight or 12.01 a.m. on Saturday. Of course, those of you within reason, you don't start celebrating until later nine the next night. So I guess we'll hold it. And also, I would like to make a suggestion. I guess we'll end up, maybe we will here. Maybe I'll change my mind and insist we'll all pitch in a few bucks. Maybe this time go to a big hotel and rent a ballroom, go to a strange place and make asses of ourselves. <laughs> and everyone will have to wear tuxes and off-the-shoulder gowns. Especially, I know Derek and John would look good. I've seen, I've seen, I know the ones they had planned. But I was going to say, if anybody is interested, we'll put up, put up a list. Marsha, uh, I've thought about this once or twice. Maybe we'll have amateur night, but amateur with a capital A. And anybody who would like to do something, put down your name, like juggle, be a stand-up comic. It's got to be within reason, like, you know, seven or eight minutes in case you're no good. <laughs> or to sing, and if anybody wants to sing or play an instrument, make a note on the list, put your name and say, I want to sing, and then put if you'd like to have some musical background. We've got enough musicians, and we might let somebody rehearse with you for 30 or 40 seconds. <laughs> but let's see if we've got enough people, and especially if you do something that you had really never done, such as you'd be safe with us because that is part of the purpose of the group. One of the purposes is the privilege of not being what you seem to be. So, if you always want a chance to get up and sing the, God forbid, the overture, sans words, I guess, to Aida, even though none of us know exactly, yeah, he does, how it goes, or if you want to get up and tell jokes. But put up a list and we'll see if there's enough people. And I do reserve the right, I guess we'll go ahead and have an outdoor party during the day, but I may just suddenly get Derek or somebody to go rent us a ballroom at one of the hotels and we'll go away from here and do it differently. I'll let you know, but it'll be on the 30th, unless I change my mind. <laughs> the task is this. Five times a day, starting tomorrow, for one week, five times a day, I want you to count them. You have to take a little notebook with you. I want you to act upon, previously, thoughts of action. Some area, you won't have any trouble where you have had thoughts of action, you've got a week that five times on each day for that week, I want you to take appropriate action. I want you to take action upon these heretofore thoughts of action. That's here and in every other city. I want everyone to remember Jim Davey. He is sick. He is sick. And remember the people in the other cities, in New York and California and Miami. Someone was asking me again this week, uh, was there any way to have influence over people you weren't directly connected with? And one, one time I gave you a little short almost a non-verbal description of what little words there was about what I mean by remember somebody. But you can hold a non-verbal awareness of somebody. It's almost being able to picture somebody without thinking about them to change neural eyes. As you can remember the person, you can think about, you can remember them without thinking about them, without talking about them. 
It's an attempt to even at line level consciousness to get close to real love. It's to be able to think about them or to remember them without thinking about them in the ordinary sense that there is no conditions to it. It's just a feeling of, I hate to say it, it's the reality of what love would be, of a warmth, an unconditional, I'm in favor of you, of being able to picture the person sans any negative wiring on your part and to be able to even try and remember them without whatever negative flows they're undergoing, such as illness. There's none of you that's not possible or don't look for some kind of instant magic or to find some way that you seem to be able to prove that you can do it. Because even if you knew how to do it, you cannot necessarily do it all the time because the chord progressions of life are such, for instance, that nobody can stop death. So it's not that you can always do this in some sense. But there is a great change in the odds if you have a handful of people that attempt to do it and if just the handful, if they just have a glimpse of it, even if they have different pieces of a general glimpse, it's different than just one person attempting, as ordinary people would say, I guess. I'm trying to think good thoughts about my grandmother who's sick, or I, I think about her and I pray about her. That's all a reflection of what I'm talking about. It is the attempt through non-red circuit means, through not being necessarily with a person and hugging them or holding them and saying, I love you and I'm concerned if you die, I feel like I died. Or when you're sick, I get sick. That's one thing. But it is possible to move energy across distance. But just do not look for an absolute magic trick or just because I gave you some description. Don't go off and feel bad if you try to do it about your, had a grandmother who was sick. I'm not saying we'll stop her from dying. I can't stop anybody from dying. I can't stop me from dying, which works out just fine. But there is a reality. It's what I mean by attempt to remember somebody who's sick, or for me just tell you to remember the people in the other cities that to varying degrees, at varying times, feel like they're far removed from this and hold on by the skin of their 